Yeah, I didn't get through. I called. Don't give me. I'll have my call. They're old school. They don't. But yeah, but then that was in the R T D. I was setting up, man. I wanted to hear the hair cut and stuff. Go ahead and write with Chester. Elliot, bring up the podium mic. Okay, test. One, two, three, four, five, six. I have no video. Mike. Elliot, are you full screen? I have no video. Yeah, thank you. He was still struggling trying to get the windows reset. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, it looks good to me, man. Um, I, I hope LT had to get it. <laughs> Say again?
Well, good afternoon. Thanks to all of you for joining us today, and happy Friday. Today, I want to talk about testing, entering phase one, and state revenues. First, I'd like to talk about how Virginia is counting its test. From the beginning of this pandemic, the Virginia Department of Health has been including all tests in its tally. There are two basic types of tests. The antibody test, which is a blood test, or what we call a serological test, and the PCR test, which is performed with a nasal swab. They are designed to answer two different questions. The PCR test detects if someone actively has the coronavirus. The antibody test detects if someone has been infected in the past. At the start, very few of those tests that we were doing in Virginia were the antibody test or serological test. Most were the nasal swabs, which we call PCR tests. But as more antibody tests are approved at the federal level, more people have begun getting those tests. When I learned about it recently, I directed the Virginia Department of Health to separate those tests out. In medical terms, we disaggregated the two groups. They have done that, and we can see now that antibody tests made up approximately 15,000 of the 184,000 total tests we've done since February, about 9%. The important thing for all of us to understand is that when we take out the antibody test, our trends remain the same. I'd like to show you what I mean. On this slide, you can see what our trends look like with all tests included, both the PCR and antibody tests. The positivity rate with all tests is 13.4%. And on this slide, you'll see what the trend looks like with only PCR test. Looking only at the PCR test, we have a 15% positivity rate statewide. As you can see, the curves look very similar. And we continue to see a downward trend in positive test. You also see that counting only PCR tests our testing numbers are still going up. VDH's reporting will keep the PCR test and the serology test separate moving forward. Virginia State Epidemiologist Dr. Lillian Peake is here if anyone has more questions during the question and answer period. It's important to understand that we are continuing to make significant progress on our testing. I'd like to show you a few examples. As you see on April the 21st, we had done testing at 58 sites. Three weeks later, as of May the 14th, we've had 215 public testing sites and we have 52 more that are lined up. These testing sites range from hospitals to federally qualified health centers and free clinics to pharmacies and health departments. For example, we're planning testing at 12 free clinics and 75 federally qualified health centers, which serve people who are uninsured or otherwise have limited access to health care. Hospital systems like George Mason are conducting testing at their clinics. And our state lab is helping to support testing with collection kits. They've sent 500 to the health wagon in Wise to support testing in Southwest Virginia. The state lab has sent thousands of collection kits out to local health districts and community clinics to support point prevalence testing. Today, phase one for much of Virginia begins. That means a slight easing of restrictions. Earlier this week, I approved a request from several jurisdictions in Northern Virginia to delay phase one because their case counts, hospitalizations, and other measures were higher than in other areas of the state. Yesterday, I granted a similar 
request from Richmond Mayor LeVar Stoney and the Accomack County Board of Supervisors. Our primary concern throughout this situation has been public health. We also recognize that has major implications on everyone who is not working and for our state budget. We knew that and yesterday we announced the first monthly revenue report in which we really see the impact of this situation is having on our economy. For April, Virginia's revenue collections were down 26%. That is about $700 million less than we would normally collect. Our prediction is that we'll see about a $1 billion loss by the end of June. Last month, we worked with the General Assembly to set aside new spending that we had planned for the next budget year. While we assess, assess the effects the pandemic is having on our finances. We'll continue that work going forward. I'd like Secretary of Finance Aubrey Lane to briefly explain the revenue situation to you. Aubrey, thank you for being here. Um, thank you, Governor. Um, as the Governor mentioned, we did experience about a $700 million decrease in revenues uh, for the month. But economic activity in the Commonwealth held up well. Approximately 80 percent of our revenues come from payroll withholding, and that was up 4 percent for the month, meaning that we had quite a few businesses still operating and paying their, uh, their employees. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with the strength of the economy. You've heard the government mention before we went into this. Uh, we also have a strong reliance on defense spending. Those have remained open, those shipyards. Certainly the federal government has remained open. We have a lot of employees of the federal government that are here. So while we have been impacted, uh, we did not see a total uh, shutdown of economic activity. Again, with 60% of our revenues, ongoing revenues, up about 4%. About 20% of our revenues come from sales taxes, and they were even for the month, reflecting the move away from uh, in-store purchases now to online, and that was strong, again, during the month. It also reflected a switch from food uh, sales taxes being paid in restaurants to in grocery stores, as we saw quite a bit of activity at the large grocers. <clears throat> Excuse me. And on top of that, um, I think it also uh, reflects the fact that um, um, our ABC stores were open as those sales were up uh, substantially during the month relating to the general fund. So as you can see, even though economic activity was impacted by uh, the, the uh, coronavirus and the shutdown of businesses, also economic activity continues on in the Commonwealth. And I, I do expect it, as the governor said, to impact us the next couple of months or into the future. But again, our strong basis going into has helped mitigate this. Now, where the loss came from for the month was for the governor's decision to delay the tax filing payment uh, for last year's taxes from May 1st to June 1st. We would have normally received quite a bit of money in the end of April uh, for payments due May 1st. Uh, now they'll come in at the end of May uh, and if due June 1st and some in June. So we had approximately 260,000 individuals and uh, companies pay us this year compared to 540,000 last year during the month. So we do expect to see this going forward, picking up in the month of May uh, and in the month of June. Now that's when we'll know exactly where we stand. But the good news is, as the governor mentioned, we had projected to be down about a billion dollars for the quarter, and it looks like we are trending right on that. And uh, we'll see how that goes the next couple of months. And while that's important is because I think it's uh, very uh, prophetic that today is the first day that we begin phase one because now we'll see how the economy is going to respond as we open up. So between now and the end of June, we'll have 45 to 60 days to see how that goes. We'll see how the tax payments come in. Um, and then by the time we need to reforecast our revenues, we'll have some data points that we can use to give us a realistic view of going forward. You've heard the governor talk about before, doing a reforecast when all this uncertainty would make a lot of, not a lot of sense. We'll have some of that certainty as we go forward, and that's when you'll expect us to see the reforecast our revenues. Just a quick 
uh, comment also, the governor asked me to talk about stimulus funds. As you know, I've mentioned before, the Commonwealth has received over $6 billion in stimulus funds related to some four different uh, relief acts and 61 or so different revenue streams. Of course, the one that gets the most uh, publicity is the $3.1 billion we received for the CARES Act. And so we've had some activity around that I'd like to share with you. On May the 12th, we issued instructions to localities around the Commonwealth that we would be distributing approximately $650 million to be used uh, for uh, direct costs re related to um, the virus. They're expected to be distributed here by the 1st of June. We're waiting on the certifications to come back. And we've also already appropriated or obligated about $121 million um, under the purview of VDEM um, for the purchase of PP&E. And included in that is also $42.3 million for testing. Now that doesn't include testing the National Guard's done in some of our private labs. And of course, this is going to be an ongoing expenditure, uh, but we've already uh, obligated about $121 million in that. Over and above that, before we knew we were going to get stimulus funds, we had $58 million set aside. And the general fund to cover these costs will use stimulus funds to cover those. So altogether, we've obligated about $878 million out of the $3.1 million that we've been given so far. And on Monday, the 18th, we'll be receiving other requests from all our agencies, and we'll be going through the process of how we're going to allocate the rest of the money. So that's an update of both where our revenues are where we're headed, and the stimulus funds. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Lane. We continue to work on other areas of response to this pandemic. For example, as some businesses expand their operations under phase one, we know there will be employees who have concerns about how their workplace is following our guidelines. The health department and other state agencies regulate businesses, and they have the authority to investigate complaints and shut down a business that isn't complying. Workers who feel that their workplace is unsafe can also report a complaint to the Department of Labor and Industry. You've heard us talk about that before. DOLLY is what we've referred to that as, and they will investigate and enforce worker protection rules. I also know that there are workers who are afraid to go back to work because of medical reasons. Every state is dealing with this issue. Because we are restricted by federal guidelines on unemployment, for example, I spoke last week with our congressional delegation and asked them to help me push for the flexibility that we need here in Virginia. In the meantime, we are strictly enforcing the workforce safety guidelines. I've also directed our chief workforce advisor, Dr. Megan Healy, to provide relief through the unemployment adjudication process. If you can show that your workplace is not being safe, let's see how we can work with you to make sure that you get the support that you need and that you deserve. I want to wrap up with a reminder that many localities have local elections next Tuesday, May the 19th. I have strongly encouraged Virginians to vote absentee by mailing, to, by mailing in uh, their ballots. And I encourage everybody between now and May the 19th to please do so if you have an absentee ballot. As we move forward in phase one, I want to again remind Virginians that easing restrictions does not mean we can behave as we used to. Everyone still needs to stay home as much as possible. As you know, we've gone from a stay at home to a safer at home. You still need to wash your hands and stay physically apart from others. Large gatherings of more than 10 people are still not a good idea. And I strongly encourage everyone to wear face coverings in public to protect themselves and to protect other people. This virus is still very much with us and no one should let their guard down. Now I'll ask Virginia's Health Commissioner, Dr. Norm Oliver, to speak, and then we'll be glad to take your questions. Dr. Oliver, thank you. Thank you, Governor. 
the Virginia Department of Health's mission is to protect the health and well-being of all uh, Virginians. And given the health inequities experienced by communities of color, rural populations, and other marginalized and vulnerable people, we do this work with, in such a way as to reduce and hopefully eliminate such health inequities. As we go forward uh, with our move into phase one and ramping up of our contact tracing or identification of people who might have been exposed to COVID-19, this will be very much the lens through which we will do this work. We now have about 4,000 applications uh, for our contact tracers. Uh, we are in conversation with our local health department district uh, directors on to determine and finalize the distribution of the contact tracers and other staff based on the case counts in their uh, districts and the district's uh, own needs in terms of what they have in existing staff, as well as the populations that they serve. So for example, needing Spanish-speaking contact tracers or uh, uh, people who can speak Haitian Creole or other uh, needs. We're also finalizing the onboarding plan for the uh, 1,000 or so contact tracers that we're hiring in terms of training, background investigations, and so on. As to our numbers, um, the total cases now stand at 28,672. New cases uh, reported in the last period are 859. Total deaths are 977. And that represents 22 new deaths in the recent, uh, in that last reporting period. Um, cases among African Americans is 4,586, or about 23% of the cases. Uh, deaths in the African-American uh, population, 207, uh, which is about 24%. For Latinx uh, uh, community uh, cases were 8,466, that's 44% of the cases, and the deaths in that community, community 76, or about 10% uh, of the cases. And I'll stop there and uh, leave some time for questions. Thank you, Governor. Oh, appreciate it. Here on Monday when your chief of staff defended the practice of co-reporting test results at length. So I'm wondering why you didn't say something about your concerns then and when you found out that the practice was going on. And sort of related to this, um, at this point, you know, we've seen a number of dating reporting problems from VDH from co-reporting this data to changes in methodology to even one error that made it look like a child had died. So I'm wondering, have you thought that the data reporting from your department has been satisfactory or would you like to have seen it done better? Yeah, the, your question is regarding the, the collection of data in, in Virginia and uh, we had a press conference on Monday. Uh, we talked about uh, the number of tests that we had done on that day. Uh, I became aware uh, on Monday uh, that the two tests, as I explained earlier in my comments, were aggregated, that we were using those together. They're, they're both tests that, that we use today. Um, the antibody test, which is not as accurate, the specificity and sensitivity of the test uh, continues to be improved on. The FDA hasn't approved a lot of those tests. But as we move forward to see if someone has had the virus in the past, it will actually be uh, very important. Um, but as far as the reporting and looking at the positivity rate, uh, I became aware of that on Monday. Um, I uh, took issue uh, with the way it was being reported. Um, I went to the VDH and said that I uh, think these need to be uh, disaggregated. Uh, that was done. Uh, I take uh, ownership of that, um, and that's what leaders do. And then otherwise, do you think that the data reporting has been satisfactory by the department? We're making improvements every day, Kate. Uh, I'm proud of my team. Uh, uh, we've been in this pandemic for, for two months. Uh, we're working around the clock, and uh, we will continue to do everything that we can uh, to keep Virginians safe. Yes, thank you, Governor. My question is for Secretary Moran. We have had 210 people infected with COVID at the Dillwyn Correctional Center. I'm wondering what went wrong there, whether prison administrators there and throughout the system have been told to communicate truthfully with inmates about the outbreak. 
and how long you're prepared to keep inmates locked down. Uh, the question has to do with one of our many correctional facilities, in particular Dillwyn, and I would respond to the question. The reason we know there are so many positive cases at Dillwyn, I believe reporter used 241. I'd, I'd have to verify that, but I'll take your word for it. 210, 210. yeah. 210. Uh, is because we have done, we've conducted point prevalence testing. And as I mentioned Wednesday, we are so pleased we're able to do point prevalence testing at as many facilities as possible. We've, what we've done Deerfield, Buckingham, Dillwyn, uh, the list goes on. Uh, uh, and we actually have several scheduled again next week, I think Haynesville and Green Rock and others. So that is just extremely important for DOC to have that uh, information so that they can take the necessary steps in addition to what they are already doing to ensure quarantine. And, and Sandy, since you've asked about the Department of Corrections, I want to highlight the fact that a lawsuit that was filed against us for cruel and unusual punishment has been dismissed. And, and the settlement agreement uh, I'm very pleased with. In fact, uh, it essentially memorializes much of what DOC is already doing to ensure the health and safety of their staff and all uh, 30,000 inmates that they have custody of. Uh, all the hygiene, the soap, uh, the per personal protective equipment they're distributing. Uh, they've gone to extraordinary steps following CDC guidelines, and the court agreed. Uh, and frankly, the only uh, thing we've taken from the court settlement that we had not been doing uh, was to release the number of inmates released on a daily basis. In front of that had been a topic of much discussion. We were, we were anxious to provide you all more information because I think DOC is doing a phenomenal job with their early release program. And so that number now is reflected on the website, uh, the daily release numbers. So thank you for the question. And uh, well, thank you. You haven't, answered, you haven't answered any of my questions. What went wrong at Dillwyn? Have administrators been told to communicate with inmates truthfully? And how long are you prepared to keep inmates locked down? The reporter asked a question that uh, apparently she takes issue with some of my responses. I would suggest to you nothing went wrong at Dillwyn. Uh, DOC is following CDC guidelines as the court actually has confirmed. They'll continue to follow those guidelines rigidly to ensure the safety of their inmates. The lockdown, uh, which you reference in the question of lockdown, just means you keep units separated so that there is no intermingling of units, and that provides DOC officials the opportunity to keep them separate and, and, and uh, diminish the opportunity to spread the virus. So uh, we'll continue to what's in the best interest of all of our correctional officers and those that are in our custody. Hey, Governor, you said you don't want a piecemeal of restrictions from county to county and place to place. Um, and also, as we've said many times, we're dealing with a virus that knows no boundaries here. So from a public health perspective, how effective really is it to have one county on the eastern shore as well as Richmond staying closed when the surrounding areas are not? And what do you say to people who say that a regional approach should have been embraced sooner? The question is about the regional approach, uh, why some uh, localities uh, have been allowed to delay entering uh, phase one, and I think you've, you've already uh, heard Northern Virginia, uh, the Eastern Shore, Accomack County, uh, which has a unique situation uh, with the chicken processing uh, plants, as well as a couple of nursing homes, and then, and then here in Richmond. Jackie, I would answer your question just to step back a bit. Um, I have said all along that this is a fluid situation. It changes literally by the hour. And, and I'll just offer you a, a comment as a, as a doctor. Uh, things change. Uh, uh, a diagnosis might be made one day. Uh, the patient may come in a, a day or a week later. Things have changed. And, and we have to reassess. We have to reevaluate. And we change our diagnosis. And we change our plans. That's the way we move forward. So um, as we have looked at the, the data, um, as we have entered phase one, there are obviously uh, several areas, several regions uh, in Virginia uh, that numbers are not as promising as other parts of the state. Um, and so at their request, uh, uh, as you heard on Wednesday, we had the leadership from Northern Virginia. Uh, they submitted a letter 
uh, asking uh, for permission to uh, delay entering phase one. We had the same from the mayor, uh, Mayor Stoney, uh, from Richmond yesterday, um, and also from the Board of Supervisors on the Eastern Shore. So uh, I listened. Uh, they're, they're local leaders. Uh, they know that area better than certainly uh, anybody else, um, and I uh, granted their request. Greg Hambrick with Inside Nova. Uh, Governor, uh, really bouncing off that idea of, you know, the local leaders knowing best, uh, three supervisors in western Loudoun County have sent a letter to your office earlier this week asking to be treated separately from uh, the eastern portions of the county that, that are more uh, suburban and urban and uh, as opposed to their rural area in western Loudoun County. Uh, can you speak to whether the, the whether the, your office is, is interested in, in helping you know these these rural parts of these counties? The question is uh, uh, a certain uh, the western part of of Loudoun County asked permission for uh, their portion of the county to be able to enter uh, phase one with the rest of Loudoun County not. I've also had requests from the Eastern Shore um, where we uh, established that the county would delay whether towns uh, and if you kind of think through this uh, we want to be as straightforward and as consistent as we can uh, but if, if if you do something that carbs up counties or pick certain uh, towns and not I mean it would just get totally uh, out of hand so um, while I'm sure the, the decisions that I make are difficult for some individuals to uh, to understand. Uh, we have tried to be consistent. We've tried to be fair. Um, and most importantly, uh, we've uh, concentrated on public safety. And um, uh, at the end of the day, we want Virginians uh, to be safe uh, as well as their families. So uh, that's the decision that we made. And uh, we anticipate uh, that uh, our numbers will continue to improve, especially if we continue to follow the guidelines uh, so that at the appropriate time, uh, Northern Virginia, uh, the county of Accomack and the city of Richmond can enter uh, phase one. And we also anticipate uh, that if we continue to make progress, uh, that we'll be able to move from phase one to phase two and into phase three. So we're taking this in a stepwise fashion. We're doing it with safety and we're doing it with responsibility. Yeah. Um, this isn't a question, but I would just say that our story on antibody tests was in the Sunday paper. Um, my question is actually Richmond requested data that was first published on the BDH website today to make the decision about whether to reopen. Um, I just wonder, do you think that there are localities that maybe now that they're seeing the data could have also reasonably requested an extension? And for people who are in those locali localities that are moving on to phase one, can they feel confident that with the data that was just shared today that they're locality would have also gone into phase one? No, I would, I would say that uh, we're certainly open to discussion. Um, we, we have been as transparent as, as we can uh, with the data. Uh, we've also had, I mean, I can't tell you how many video conferences and phone calls I've had with leadership from, from VML and VACO and our uh, mayors and our, uh, our state senators and, and delegates as, as well as our, our, our federal leaders. So. Uh, we've had an ongoing discussion. If there are uh, areas as we move forward that, that don't feel comfortable with uh, the trends that they're seeing, then we're open-minded and, and willing to have those discussions. Um, I will tell you, and I, I think you've done a good job uh, with the uh, data and statistics. Um, one of the uh, challenges, Mel, um, and I, so I would say kind of to be a little bit cautious, is that uh, when you're looking at the aggregate of Virginia, uh, and looking at the positivity rates, those trends, they're much more accurate uh, when you look at the entire state together because you've got larger numbers. And so if you go into a, a locality, uh, just pick one, um, and you're just picking out that data from the entire set, uh, it makes it a little bit more challenging. But again, uh, I understand that. Our epidemiologists understand it. Um, and I can just tell you that we uh, have been in almost constant communication with with individuals leaders across Virginia and we will continue to be uh, to you know to work and get through this together about 
Well, we uh, talked to our epidemiologist. Uh, we talked to our folks at the Virginia Department of Health. Uh, uh, we talked to uh, Mayor LeVar Stoney and, and putting all of that information together. Uh, and at their request uh, yesterday, uh, we made the decision to, to grant their request for delay of two weeks. Thank you. Good afternoon. This question is for both the governor and Dr. Oliver. Dr. Oliver, have you made your decision yet about Petersburg's request to withdraw the water reconnection certification? And can you comment on your discussions with the city earlier this week? And governor, the city maintains it's being singled out by the state over something that they were working on internally. They claim the whole involvement by the state in the water issue is a political ploy instigated by Delegate Ayer based on a complaint by one constituent that she took and, quote, ran to the governor's office with it, unquote, without properly vetting the issue. Do you care to comment on the state's response and Petersburg's reaction? Yes, I didn't hear all of your words in the second part of the question. Hopefully, Dr. Oliver uh, heard on the first part. Um, but I think your, your question was uh, whether someone uh, filed a complaint to my office and that we reacted to that without being vetted. That's not the way the, the process occurred. Um, actually, one of the, the delegates uh, who represents that area uh, notified uh, me that uh, there were individuals, there were households in the city of Petersburg that were without running water. Um, and my knee-jerk response uh, without betting or anything else was to say that we are in a pa pandemic. We are encouraging uh, people to, to maintain good hygiene, to, to wash their hands frequently. And, and so one way or the other, uh, we have to come together as a society with local leaders and make sure that everybody has access to running water. And so that decision was very easy for me to make. Um, I uh, talked to our uh, Commissioner of uh, Health, uh, Dr. Oliver, and uh, he uh, took the next step and, and made sure that people in Petersburg have running water. So. Uh, <clears throat> the question addressed to me was whether or not I uh, had made a decision about um, uh, the city of Peterbur Petersburg's request to rescind the certification I issued uh, mandating that they uh, uh, turn on the water connections for a number of homes uh, in the city. Uh, I had an uh, opportunity to have a discussion with the uh, administration, the uh, mayor, uh, city manager uh, of uh, Petersburg. We had a good conversation in which uh, they outlined a number of steps they had taken to uh, turn on uh, water connections. Uh, we talked about a possible path forward. I th we're working on that. I haven't yet uh, made a decision on that, but I hope to do so very shortly. Uh, the sheriff of Culpeper County has said that he will not uh, enforce the, the rules that you've set for the businesses that are being allowed to, to reopen, like face masks for wait staff, things like that. Um, What's your, what's your response to that? And then just more broadly, what role do you see for law enforcement in, in the enforcement of that order? Because I did, I did see that you're, there's a misdemeanor penalty potential there. Yes, the question is if uh, law enforcement agents uh, choose not to enforce our laws, I would just say I don't think that's a good idea. And we'll deal with that. Do you think it's important? Like, do you see a role for law enforcement in the, in the enforcement of this? Is, is that gonna be an important part of, the, of, of phase one? Absolutely. Next up is David McGee with the Bristol Herald Courier. Yes, thank you, Governor. I wanted to ask about the election. What uh, guidance, if any, has the state given to local registrars to minimize exposure to voters and poll workers on Tuesday? Yes, sir, I appreciate the question. Um, I appreciate all your questions, so uh, I hope you uh, realize that. The, the question was, what are we doing to protect our poll workers um, at our, our polling places on Tuesday. Uh, first of all, uh, I have encouraged uh, Virginians that can to vote absentee. Uh, re regarding the poll workers, um, we have uh, used our volunteer medical corps to uh, have people, as well as our National Guard, to have people staff our polling places that are younger, uh, that have uh, less uh, risk factors for if they contract the virus. So 
also making sure that they have the PPE, the personal protective equipment, uh, at the polling places. So um, we're taking all measures that we can, uh, dis you know, social distancing, uh, uh, cleanliness, uh, cleaning the machines, all of these types of things uh, uh, have been taken into account. And, and we have done everything that we can uh, to make voting uh, as safe as it can be, uh, as I've said before. Uh, someone shouldn't have to choose between their health and voting. Uh, this was a reason that I uh, suggested and recommended uh, that the May election be moved to November. Uh, the House of Delegates uh, agreed and supported that. The Senate didn't. Uh, so here we are. Uh, I have, as governor, been able to postpone that election, which was initially on May 5th, for two weeks. That's the uh, authority that I have, uh, but I can't uh, uh, postpone it any longer than that. Um, but in addition to that, we've done everything that we can to, to make it safe. So I, I appreciate people abiding by our guidelines, and I also appreciate people voting. Uh, that's what makes our democracy strong. On the Richmond exemptions, um, should people not come into the city? Should they not leave the city? Are you worried this is going to cause some confusion over the next two weeks or so? The question is, should people not leave the city and not come into the city. I, you know, I, I don't think anything as far as staying in phase zero has changed. Obviously, it's still stay at home. Uh, it's not safer at home uh, in Richmond. Um, but aside from that, uh, you know, life will go on. If someone has to leave for an essential purpose, uh, they will be allowed to do that. Uh, so um, I, I appreciate your question if, if there's confusion. Um, hopefully that will be kept to a minimum. I think most people know where the, you know, the boundaries are of the city of Richmond, but um, I just encourage whether people are leaving, coming, whatever they're doing to uh, maintain the guidelines that we have proposed, the, the social distancing, the hand washing, and, and please encourage everybody to wear protective uh, face equipment. Yeah, next is uh, Roberto Roldan, VPM. Yes, uh, Governor, you've letter to Virginia's congressional delegation offering to test all immigrant detainees at Carolyn and Farmville detention centers. Um, you say in the letter that this requires permission from the federal government. While these are federal detainees, these are still local and regional jails. So uh, my question is, why do you need permission from the federal government to do this testing? And do you not have the same authority over these facilities as other local and regional jails? Yeah, the question is the state's authority to go into a federal uh, facility. And I'm, I'm going to let uh, Secretary Moran address that. Thanks. Thank you, go the go Governor. Uh, the reporter asserts that these are local and regional jails holding uh, these immigrants uh, pursuant to ICE to, uh, detainers. The fact is they are not state or regional jails. They are not controlled by state or regional jail. Therefore, they're not a state facility or even a local facility. They are operated. Uh, by the federal government, ICE. So we do not have the authority to do what the governor has asked the congressional delegation to do, and that's why he's asked them to be to intervene on their behalf. And thank you, Brian. And just to follow up, um, we do need federal permission to go into those facilities, but we have uh, volunteered our services and our supplies uh, because we feel strongly that the, these individuals and their staff should be tested. So. Uh, from the state perspective, we're willing to do that. Yeah. Uh, Governor, back to the, uh, the Richmond decision and the, the yeah. um, more local data, the percent positivity. Um, I know it's showing the health district right now, but Richmond said they had made their request yesterday because they requested that local breakdown. Um, were they the only locality that got that percent positivity breakdown prior to the start of phase one? Um, if so, why, why was this not, I guess, provided to all localities so they could see leading into one if they could have made that request. Sure. I'll, I'll let Dr. Carey address that. Thanks, Dan. Uh, thank you, Governor. The, the question is, uh, as the city of Richmond had asked for that data, at the, uh, did we, uh, did other localities also not or have access to that data? Um, the facts are that that was a part of the website that's being constantly improved and updated. And that functionality, the ability to look at those data sets, whether it be uh, positivity, the number of tests by day, that you could go to the, um, for example, the zip code data, 
was a, an improvement. And each, each week, we're looking to improve the, the diversity and, and granularity of data. And that was, this week was our uh, moving to have that data available on a locality and health district basis, which you see now functional today. And that was part of our, our improvement. Uh, Dr. Peak and the, the, the data team uh, have been designing that to, again, add functionality. This is not a, uh, a stagnant environment. This is a, a truly a, a novel condition. The metrics are, are principled, but also we're developing those uh, uh, around, the, 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 you know, around the country to find out how we best measure this. And we fell on those measures. And it was important to have those first on the state level and then to make them available in, uh, by localities. So it turned out that uh, they asked us for that. So in the midst of constructing the entire site to allow that available for everyone, we, we said, hey, please, the, the city of Richmond really wants that data. Let's construct it as quickly as we can with the individual data sets while the entire tool was not yet finished. And that was finished between Wednesday and yesterday, and now you see it in full functionality. So the, it really had to do with the question that was asked, when it was asked, and our desire to provide the information for that locality as accurately as we possibly could. Um, and they were the only locality that, that made that request, and that today we, that information is available. You had said that if a locality now sees what their local percent positivity is and they're like, you know, we don't like the way it's going, you might consider talking with them about rolling back into phase zero? We were certainly open to that discussion. Uh, to, to date, I haven't had anybody that says they'd like to go back into phase zero, but we're to be determined. Can I get a second question from my friends at TKR? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you for Brendan Ponton. Apparently, um, Virginia Beach had given an indication that there might be changes to beach restrictions, especially with Memorial Day. Is that any truth to that, or was that going to be staying at the fitness and uh, fishing only exemptions? The question is, what about our beaches? And we are actively uh, having discussions uh, with the localities. I was on, the, on a video conference uh, a couple hours ago with the city of uh, Virginia Beach and, and their leaders. Uh, we've also uh, been in touch with uh, the leaders in Norfolk, for example. They have a significant number of beaches, Hampton, uh, the Eastern Shore, uh, and other areas where there, there are smaller beaches. And so uh, Virginia Beach, uh, with our Secretary of Natural Resources and, and their staff, are working on a very comprehensive plan for Virginia Beach. Uh, we'll continue to work on that uh, through the weekend. It's been very collaborative. Um, and uh, I'm prepared uh, to make an announcement uh, probably on, on Monday uh, regarding our, our beaches are around the Commonwealth of Virginia and in anticipation to your question uh, of Memorial Day weekend. The, uh, Cam, the, uh, the most important thing and, and why I'm so proud of, of the city of Virginia Beach and the approach that they're taking is to do it safely. Um, and that's uh, what all of us uh, agree on. Uh, we, we understand it's Memorial Weekend. Uh, we understand what's going on with our economy uh, in Virginia, but the, the, the top priority uh, for all of us uh, is to do it safely and to make sure that, uh, that, that the beachgoers uh, will feel comfortable coming back to our beaches. Alan Suderman with the Associated Press. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Governor, if a county that has zero cases formally requested to go into phase two um, for other parts of the state, would you allow that? And if not, why not? Uh, Alan, thank you for the question. The question was if counties uh, that have zero cases uh, desire to go into phase two earlier than others, we'll certainly, I'm open for that discussion, but I, I haven't made any decisions in that regard yet. Governor, as you may know, the Legislative Black Caucus met this week and they're quite opposed to moving into phase one. Um, they made the statement that we do not want Virginians outside of Northern Virginia uh, to be economic guinea pigs. They're concerned about um, restrictions on churches, child care, um, worker safety, black businesses, testing um, data for ethnic and racial groups that are still not fully in and minority unemployment. You've proudly talked about your work 
with your equity and inclusion diversity task force but they have these concerns so yes. where is the disconnect and what would you say to the this legislative black body yeah the the question was from the uh, uh virginia legislative black caucus a, a letter that i received uh, i believe it was on wednesday actually this is right after this uh press conference and uh, addressing the concerns that you just raised. And first of all, I'd say, Andre, I have a great relationship with the, the Black Caucus, and I really do appreciate their input, and I listen to their input. Um, and they raised a number of concerns, and I'll, I'll just address a couple of those. But uh, the first was uh, the PPE. Uh, were we, did we have enough PPE in, in communities of color to, to make sure that people were safe? And um, we have a health equity task force uh, led by Dr. Janice Underwood. Um, and we have actually been out in the community, uh, Harrisonburg, here in Richmond, uh, with a lot of volunteers uh, handing out PPE. So, so that continues to improve uh, on a daily basis. Um, testing was also something that was very important to uh, the Black Caucus. And, and just as we've done with the PPE, we have ramped up our abilities to test. We are going out into communities. There have been several communities that we've uh, tested right here in Richmond. Um, we'll continue to expand that uh, through Virginia as we, we move forward. So, so that's improving uh, on a daily basis. Uh, another issue which is uh, very important to especially my wife and also me is childcare. Um, and wanting to make sure that uh, when our workers uh, return to their place of business, uh, that their children have a place that's safe and affordable. Um, we have worked very hard, as you know, on early childhood education uh, and also on child care throughout Virginia. And part of the CARES Act uh, is $68 million that we're putting toward child care to make sure that, that these families have somewhere safe for their, their children uh, to be. So, so, yes, I take their input and, and uh, their concerns very seriously. Um, I also will say that uh, I follow the data. Um, and work on these areas of inequities as we move forward. And, and I'll continue to work with the Black Caucus uh, and work uh, throughout Virginia to, to make sure that, that people are safe, that they feel safe, and that they can continue with their lives. And one last thing I will mention too, Andre, um, that's part of that and was addressed in their, their letters is what about the workers that are on the front lines that, that may not feel comfortable going back? And I addressed that earlier uh, in my comments, but but that's an important issue, um, and certainly if they're they're individuals uh, that that have health issues or have someone else that lives in their house that have health issues and they don't feel comfortable, we have the means. We're working with our uh, our chief workforce uh, officer to you know to to work through some of those challenges. So um, so I appreciate it uh, uh, the letter, their their correspondence, and and I think we're working together to address a lot of those uh, challenges. Not know about your task force, the equity task force. I I can't speak for them, Andre, um, but uh, if they're listening today, um, we have a health equity task force that's doing wonderful work across the Commonwealth, and uh, would encourage them to to be part of that, a part of our efforts as we we move forward. So thank you for the question, and and thanks to all of you for uh, listening today. Uh, um, as we uh, have said today uh, is a is a big step for us moving into to phase one, and I just wanted to to remind all of you in in order to continue uh, in phase one, and then hopefully get into phase two, and then phase three, and then finally put this healthcare issue behind us. Uh, we're all in this together. We all have a responsibility, and we need to continue to do the things that we've been doing all along. The, the social and physical distancing, the, the hand washing, the, the wearing uh, of facial protection. Uh, if we all work together, uh, we can head in a great direction. And I think if you, you know, look at some of these curves, um, you see that the, the number of, of cases uh, are trending down. Our hospital capacity is, is in a good place. The amount of PPE, the amount of testing, all of these things are headed in a good direction. But we have to be vigilant and we have to keep working together to make sure uh, that we continue to work in a positive direction because to Cam's question earlier, the last thing that we need, the last thing we need as a, as a health issue, the last thing that we need is as, as an economic issue is to have to go back to where we've been. So let's work together and, and let's not let that happen. So have a good weekend and uh, we will look forward to being with you on Monday. Thank you.